Welcome to the Social Mobility Talks podcast brought to you by the Social Mobility Commission. The SMC publishes research on social mobility and we use this to provide advice to the government. We also work to promote social mobility ourselves by collaborating with and challenging employers, professionals, universities, schools, families and other organisations to play their part. Today's episode is hosted by me, Rob Wilson, Deputy Chair of the SMC, and I'm delighted to be joined by one of my former political bosses, David Willits. David Willits, now Baron Willits, is a politician and life peer. From 1992 to 2015, he was the Member of Parliament representing Haven constituency and served as Minister of State for Universities and Science from 2010 to July 2014 and became a member of the House of Lords in 2015. He's a very highly regarded thinker and a reformer on the centre-right of politics. He was appointed chair of the UK Space Agency's board in April 2022 and is also president of the Resolution Foundation. He's an author and he has a couple of books to his name now, University Education, and The Pinch, uh, which is about intergenerational fairness. So welcome to Social Mobility Talks podcast, David. Thank you very much, Rob. So let's get underway. Um, uh, Obviously, I'm delighted that you've come today and you've obviously got a lot of experience in the areas we're going to talk about. Um, You've had quite an influential history of talking about important subjects in and around the social mobility space. And so I'm going to begin with an area that I think you know well, And that's uh, the value of qualifications. And in particular, uh, this has been a subject that we've been debating internally within the SMC because it relates to how people um, manage to get their careers off the ground and earn more money as a result of um, those qualifications that they get. So... We did a quite substantial survey last year, which I think you've got a copy of, and um, we sought to understand a number of things. Firstly, you know, how HE and FE qualifications um, helped students to get on, people to get on in life, um, particularly from social economic backgrounds at the bottom end. And we also sought to understand what information was really available to students. Now, that did give us a number of interesting uh, pointers to what was happening out there. HE and FE both um, are associated with increased future earnings, but not across the board. Some are doing better than others. So I think where I'd like to really start is to get your view. Are there some courses and institutions that that are offering small or negative returns? Can we still really justify the huge investment that's going that going to university entails for young people well there are certainly some courses at some universities that don't appear to show that they boost your earnings Uh, but of course individuals will choose and there are benefits from university higher education more widely that uh, go way beyond earnings Um, it looks as if the experience of having some kind of project like doing a degree increases a people's capacity to plan ahead. They tend to have better health. They tend to be more likely to vote. Um, uh, so going to university changes you. And I would say in the modern world, it's become across Western countries the main way of doing the transition from childhood to independence and adulthood with a period of kind of semi-independence. Interestingly, what the apprenticeship used to do, you used to go away from home to live with your master uh, as an apprentice. And then after you'd completed your apprenticeship, you set up on your own. So the so higher education has become the main route where people kind of experiment with how they become adult, but it's not for everyone. And we need other routes. Uh, but I think, and I think above all, I'm a believer in personal choice. If people want to do it, it will probably set them free in unpredictable ways. Mm-hmm. I personally think it's quite important to have the opportunity of moving away from home. Uh, 
you may be under massive parental pressure to be a lawyer or be an accountant. And when you turn up at university, you discover you really enjoy the sport or the drama. Uh, so it is an opportunity for a kind of turning of the kaleidoscope for lots of people, an opportunity to move away from their area, move away from their parents, try something different. And so for many people, it's very worthwhile. And I think uh, many people w would agree with that point of view. But the, the, the benefits seem to beginning to be eroded in terms of the very high price that people are paying and the interest on the loans that people have, uh, young people are paying now. And I just wonder whether, other than for the ones that get the sort of big payoffs, the ones that go into the big professional jobs at the end of it, whether the, those, uh, those at the bottom are benefiting enough to make it wor worthwhile for them. Well, first of all, of course, when you say price, we should be really clear. Nobody pays up front to go to university. It is entirely, and you and I worked on this together, Rob, and it was great to work with you in the past. Um, it is entirely a graduate repayment scheme. Uh, so uh, it, it's not someone has to write a cheque to go to university. If they're in a well-paid job earning more than £25,000, they will pay back, but only as nine, on 9% of their earnings above that threshold. So if you're in a low-paid job, you don't pay back. Uh, but of course, we hope that people will be in well-paid jobs and able to afford to pay back. That's the model. Um, I th personally, though, and when you look as to who gains and how, my view is, is a bit different from yours. If you come from a rich background, your parents have perhaps paid for a private education. You've got a rich social network of people in themselves in good jobs. It's probably going to university is less necessary. You will be found a decent job through your social network. The people who gain most from going to university are people from low income backgrounds for whom it's an opportunity to do something radically different. And it is the most powerful engine of social mobility we've got. And for me, the problem is that we've got at the, probably 70 percent of people from really affluent backgrounds going to university and probably about 20, 25 percent of people from low income backgrounds. So. The last thing I want to say is that if you're from a low-income bank, you shouldn't be going to university. That's where there is the real missed opportunity. And for the Social Mobility Commission, if we can get more people from low-income backgrounds to get some kind of university experience, I think that's really valuable. And of course, it needn't be the high-profile, high-paid professional job. If your parents are running a news agent, but you go to university, and get a qualification as a pharmacist, and you end up working as a pharmacist in the same street, your own research shows high returns to doing a pharmacy course. There are those type of journeys which matter a lot for the individual. And we shouldn't think of the university as just where very rich people, or indeed very smart people, go to do some strange highfalutin subject. It's where you get trained to be a pharmacist, trained to be a nurse, trained to be an automotive engineer to work in the, work in the local car factory. But let's just test that for, for a bit, because some of the people that are coming out of universities that are um, getting less than they would if they'd have stayed in um, another job, gone through an apprenticeship or something, um, they are coming out with less career earnings than they would have done having not gone to university. So, for example, um, in the creative arts, they, we, the research we've done shows that, that has the lowest value add for men of minus 14% relative to those with similar background characteristics who did not attend higher education. And there's also, um, again, with regard to universities as a whole, a lot of variation in returns by university to those. So more selective universities, such as those in the, the Russell Group, for example, tend to have a much higher value add, um, much higher than, than obviously the ones, the post-1992 universities. They tend to have a lower value, value add. Um, albeit within them there is some variation in courses and I, I, it seems to me that the, the, the Russell Group universities also tend not to have uh, anywhere near the same number of free school meal students going to them. They have a much higher proportion of private school um, pupils going on to university to them. So there's a big difference there 
and it seems to me that maybe those in disadvantaged groups aren't getting the most out of university that they that they should be getting and certainly the HE statistics agency says that more of those should be going to the better yeah. universities well look, I um, I let me first of all I agree with I agree that more people from disadvantaged backgrounds should have the opportunity of going to the most selective research intensive Russell Group universities yes I agree with you on that um, moving on to what I don't agree with a couple of things I don't agree first of all these earnings measures at the moment we've only really been tracking earnings of graduates for people um, born since the late 1980s. And indeed, though I say it myself, one of the battles I fought as universities minister was to get this information available so it could be analysed. Um, it's imperfect. It doesn't really tell us much about the types of jobs people are doing. But its, mo its biggest single imperfection is it doesn't track anyone beyond their being in their 30s yet. When you look at the overall international evidence and the other smaller British studies, one of the difference is that if you go to, into higher education, you're on a long-term earnings trajectory. And if you, if you do an apprenticeship, you're more likely to have um, get into a decent job in a craft doing that thing, but you're then more likely to be on a plateau. So there's a plateau issue versus a rising trajectory. Now, look, my father ran an apprenticeship program. I mustn't sound like I'm against apprenticeships. People need to have that option as well. Um, but it, it kind of makes sense because when people talk about university, they often have a very misleading picture of it as just the kind of things you do at those most prestigious elite universities. I wouldn't call them the best universities. They're certainly the most prestigious. When you go to do automotive engineering at... Sunderland linked to the local Nissan factory or if you go to Northampton which was the home of course of the shoe industry to their courses on leather tanning these are vocational technical courses you can do at university however what you will do is get just a bit of generality so you won't just learn how to tan leather today You'll also learn a bit about the features of leather, which means as the technology changes, you can carry on working in the leather trade. If you go to do automotive engineering at Coventry as well, is very good at it, uh, Oxford Brooks, where it's particularly linked to the F1 industry, of course you'll learn absolutely how a motor car works today, but you'll also do some of the engineering that helps you stay with it as automotive design changes. So. Going to university doesn't mean you go and do philosophy or read novels. It often means you do highly applied stuff, but with just something a bit extra that enables, that explains why the graduates are often on a rather different earnings trajectory and they're not trapped. I always say it's the difference between people who've gone on a course to learn Fortran and people who've gone on a course to do computer science and were then stayed up could keep on going as the software changed. So um, don't be... So I, I personally think, and my plea to you guys in the Social Mobility Commission, therefore, is higher education is not for everyone, but it is your ally. It is one of the most powerful tools of social mobility and opportunity that we've got. So, so what advice would you give to a young person considering their options... Um, in terms of what they should be thinking about before applying to university? I think the most important thing is what most interests you. I think there's an awful lot of parental pressure now on exactly what you should do. Uh, in my experience, something that interests you so much that you'll dig into it deeply and the very process of digging into it deeply will help you learn and advance, would be my most important piece of advice. And my second piece of advice is, if you can move away from home, go for it. Because the, the social mobility is also linked to geographical mobility. It's an opportunity to try living in a different place, away from your parents. It's probably, again, that's what I said about, it's the route to adulthood. It's probably the most important single option people have to try out moving away from home they can always go back to home after they've graduated but try living in a different place would be my second piece of advice okay so let let's accept that uh 
university has grown and it's potentially going to grow further um, if uh, the next government, whoever it might be, follows your route. What that's going to leave the rest, the the sort of minority, to pursue other routes. So, what can we do to help those who uh, either don't want to go to university or can't go to university? How are we going to help them to get on? Well. I mean, there is, of course, the apprenticeship route. And in, incidentally, by the way, when you're saying university, sometimes I want to say higher education because universities, sh higher education comes in lots of shapes and sizes. FE colleges can deliver higher education. And, uh, and I don't want people to think that um, it's some kind of um, Oxbridge experience when, as I said, it can be incredibly sitting from sitting where we are. You can go one, you can go mile one way and be at London School of Economics with world class economists doing uh, economics. Go one mile the other way, and you're at London South Bank University, whose specialism is uh, the construction industry. And by and large, most of the large buildings in London will have been built by people. And by and large, if you're installing a ventilation system in a skyscraper, that requires some higher education to do the planning and do that. That's what London South Bank University does. It's fantastic. It doesn't get half the attention of the LSE, but it, I might, and it isn't in your list of Russell Group universities, but it's a bloody useful place to go to. Um, so I. So I think, first of all, I want higher education to be so diverse and so flexible that it fits as many people as possible. After that, there are indeed apprenticeships. Every minister tries to grow apprenticeships. But of course, the trouble with apprenticeships is it first requires an employer to take you on. And that's the barrier on apprenticeships. Um, then I personally think non-apprenticeship and traineeships are also very important and I think the folk, we'd, I don't want to be in a sort of just two options, higher education or apprenticeships. I think it should also be practical traineeships, uh, maybe delivered by FE that don't even require that you first have an employer. Because first having an employer is a barrier. And we know when you compare degree courses and degree apprenticeships in the same subject, that there's much greater diversity, ethnic diversity, and more people from low-income backgrounds in the university course than on the degree apprenticeship. Because if employers, sadly, employers are not scrutinized the way universities are on their access programs, on the type of people they recruit. So, of course, one reason why people go to university at the moment is they can't access as an apprenticeship. Where, um, as I say, if you look at it like for like, the degree apprenticeship sadly do less well on ethnic minorities, for example. So probably a little bit more scrutiny of employers to broaden access to uh, to, to uh, apprenticeships, including degree apprenticeships. There's been a lot of, actually, I mean, you mentioned apprenticeships, there's been quite a bit of recent investment um, and policy change to try and promote alternative routes uh, into uh, edu high, uh, level three, level four education. But it seems to me, and I get from what you're saying, that some of them aren't succeeding. Um, may, maybe I've misread that, but you can, yeah. you can tell me. I mean, what do you think the barriers are to young people in sort of pursuing alternative routes? Do you think that there are, they are very specific or do you think that there are very general things that stop them going? I think there are some. Uh, you're absolutely right on that. And it's the challenge. Um, and I think there are several things. I think, first of all, the, the, the five good grades at GCSE is a massive barrier. And the resit rules put people off. And someone who needs some basic maths in order to function in the career they want, being told that a slightly academic style GCSE maths, they have to keep on resitting it, is dreadful. I would change the reset requirement, make it much more flexible. Just missing out on the five good grades at GCSE is probably, if I was sitting in your shoes at Social Mobility Commission, I would say is probably the biggest single threat to social mobility in contemporary Britain. Then secondly... Sorry, the, the, the reset rules. Yeah, and the, re, the, the fact, and there's been some really powerful research on it. If you look at people, if you look at the life outcomes of people who have got their five good GCSEs and the people who just fail to get them, the gap in terms of your lifetime's earnings, your life trajectory is massive. 
we shouldn't have such a high stakes exam in uh, at 16 having that effect and then it's reinforced by the fact that if you just fail and start resitting the resit process is incredibly unrewarding it doesn't doesn't look as if there are lots of people who are a bit bored by school who didn't much enjoy maths who just failed to get the maths gcse so we then tell them they've got to resit it and they suddenly all refocus and get a great maths result second time around it's the opposite it's a kind of torture for them it doesn't help them so I think the GCSE, if you want for where there's a fork in the road that does damage to social mobility, I think GCSEs. Then secondly, and look, I'm campaigning on this in the House of Lords at the moment, NVQs are a recognised vocational qualification. They're going to be defunded next year. But T-levels, and we've just seen the latest set of figures for T-levels, which are supposed to replace them, just aren't getting the take up. And to be honest, they're pretty academic themselves. So NVQs, a recognized vocational qualification that employers are familiar with, are in danger of being defunded. So something else that I think would be a great clause to Social Mobility Commission is keeping BTECs because they're a recognized vocational qualification. And then thirdly, and I know this is, this is uh, sensitive territory, just keeping an eye on patterns of apprenticeship recruitment. Um, and especially as we now have a compulsory levy and through the levy put a lot of public money into it, just trying to make sure that people from low income backgrounds have decent opportunities of getting onto apprenticeship courses, including degree apprenticeships. Whereas I say at the moment, the evidence is that they're behind HE, they're behind universities for access, because of course it's all closely scrutinized at universities and it's, and it's not for degree apprenticeships. So there are, there's a things you could do to make because you're absolutely right, we have, a, we have people who currently get a raw deal. But I don't, what I don't do is I, I think these, prob I don't, I think HE should be under more pressure to recruit them. But it's, I don't agree with your analysis that the reason why I have these problems is we've all been seductively preoccupied with a university route. Universities, the university funding now comes from graduates and is pretty tight. It's, it's these wider problems. And of course, also, we don't have license to practice like Germany. So uh, getting a qualification that guarantees you a job is much more difficult in a liberal economy like Britain or America, rather than the license to practice model linked to apprenticeships in Germany. So, so David, if I had a um, principal of a FE college sitting next to me now, he or she would probably say to me, these people that are failing their maths their English, you know, one of the five GCSEs they need to, to basically get on in life. We're picking up all those students. And yet, you know, we haven't, we're underfunded, we're stretched, um, and we're doing a fantastic job in aiding social mobility, but nobody takes any notice of us. I completely agree. I completely agree. With that. And if you look at the area where I think we've um, got the biggest challenges, it's 16 to 18 year olds because the school's funding pledge went up to the age of 16. For higher education, we had got a funding model, controversial, but it has actually worked of expecting the graduates to pay. For apprenticeships, we've got the apprenticeship levy. For FE, colleges delivering, uh, and then the main activity of FE in Britain is not levels four and five, which is your research focus. The main fu function of FE colleges, but not the only one, is the 16 to 18 year olds are not in school. And it is grossly owned over, uh, underfunded and I completely agree with your point. Mm. So um, as you know, there, I'm just going to move on a bit from, from that if I may, um, on to sort of lifelong learning. So, so we did a State of the Nation report last year and we found that there was a, a sort of corridor of innovation that ran from Bristol r around some parts of the, the, up to some parts of the middle into, into London. And the characteristics of those innovation were really research intensive universities. And that can only come from a big research grant, which government provides to university, plus all the money that's being used to fund students to, to go to those universities. And it leaves other regions at a significant disadvantage. So what are your thoughts on how you iron that particular problem out well we, our research intensive universities are fortunately quite wide quite well geographically spread and you've got durham and you've got newcastle and you've got liverpool and you've got manchester but yeah the there is however where and where I, again i 
I agree with you. And actually, one of the re other reasons for this, for my believing that it's actually probably the growth of higher education is inevitable, and anyway, it's probably desirable, is the cold spots agenda. And I think that the, and in my experience, um, the towns that haven't yet got a university are very keen to have one. And an obvious way forward is to offer FE colleges the opportunity of becoming a university if they wish. And indeed, that is the historic path that many of has, has led to many of our universities. That's why I don't believe in this HEFE conflict. A lot of our HE institutions began as mechanics institutes in the 19th century. Portsmouth, um, near where I live in Havant, Portsmouth University was originated in a mechanics institute. And um, many of them have been on a journey where at some point the range of what they did became so great that they got university titles. So what I would be looking at is another round of HE colleges. Now, there are, uh, FE colleges, there are ways you can do it. They can become partners of a university, awarding their degrees. They can fully integrate with the university. They can get university title in their own right. But I would identify the places suffering exactly what you're describing and say, given we're going to have more and more young people going, let's not... The moment we, There was a massive surge in the birth rate 20 years ago. And I personally, I'm very, probably bringing this up, I, I'm very frustrated. We sit around discussing too many people going to university when the underlying demographic trend is perfectly clear. Over the next 10 years, there's going to be more and more people going to university just because there's more and more 18 and 19 year olds. What the hell are we going to do about it? It is a fantastic opportunity to create more university universities in towns and cities that don't yet have one. And when looking back, the historians will not say, oh, they missed their chance, Unpre unprecedented opportunity to stop people going to university. They'll say, hang on, they've got all this growth in the number of young people around them, and they didn't, and they missed the opportunity to create some new institutions with it in places that were crying out for them. So, so I take it from what you say that you think that um, places that don't have a university do have a higher risk of being left behind. Are that implicit in what you say? Um, look, I mean, I don't want to... I think it I think it does help. I mean it does it brings young people in. Because of course I as you as I was saying, I want people to move around. Some people say, Oh, the great advantage is that you stay where you are. Actually, it brings more people in. So it changes the demographics of an area. It's no accident that America has got so many universities and such a high rate of of um participation. It's how the states compete with each other. They all want to have some universities so they don't lose their their young people out of state. It's state competition. Although now Germany is going down the apprenticeship route, the original surge of research intensive universities in the 19th century was in Germany because it was how the individual German states competed. You got these young people turning up in your town or city. They spent some money. They livened things up. So yeah, I, so I think I, I and of course, also, another set of, if you haven't done enough controversy already, another thing, you attract overseas students. You boast your you boast your export earnings because you have all these people who come from abroad and pay to live in your city and spend money locally. So if you look at, and this isn't just theory, look at what has happened in, say, Lincoln, or what has happened in some of our cathedral cities like Chester or Winchester or Worcester. You see a place that hadn't, got an obvious driver of economic growth, gets a university and it's transformational and the empirical evidence is clear how transformation has been for those places. So the message I'm getting very clearly is more universities, <laughs> sorry, more no, universities, no, 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 you know, it's a, it's a fair argument to make. The only, the only question I, I would have about that is the model the financial model that is supporting universities doesn't seem to be working in the sense that there are, I think in 2022, there was a two, mil, two billion, sorry, deficit. And I just wonder how sustainable you think the current model is, um, you know, because it, it certainly is looking like more and more universities are getting into quite significant debt. Well, yeah, and the problem there, and again, it is a contrast with almost every other stage of education is that because the fees, which I set at 9,000 more than a decade ago, have only gone at once to 9,250, 
the real amount of resource for educating someone in higher education has been falling. And um, you've got, and my view is that fees should be indexed. And thank heavens, it's okay to do it because it's not that the young people have to write a check. And the amount they repay is fixed by a completely separate repayment formula, 9% above an earnings threshold. So, But that does have an impact in terms of marginal rates of tax. Well, I always say to my friends still in the House of Commons, I say, how many graduates come to your surgery to complain about their graduate repayments? And most of them can't think of an example. And the reason is, it's 9%. On earnings about now above twenty five thousand for a time it was twenty seven above twenty five thousand. So if you're if you're earning thirty five thousand, that's an extra ten thousand of earnings on which you're paying nine percent. So that's nine hundred pounds, which is about seventy five pounds a month if you're earning thirty five thousand. I mean, they by and large that isn't there are not graduates. Uh, I mean it is a cost, but um, there are not graduates rioting in the street. So the students don't pay up front. For the graduates, it's affordable. But there's some kind of view, but there's a lot of misunderstanding. Some There are parents who think somehow, I, my son goes to university, I've got to write a cheque for £9,250. That is not the system. Well, I, I can tell you uh, from my own experience of uh, three having gone through university that they're, they're not very happy about the size of the... Uh, the debt that they're going to have. To oh, pay yes, off. I know. And that is the debt. But that's why I think it's, if I may say so, of course, it. I completely understand your point. It sounds scary to have a 50,000 debt. But your kids are probably going to pay £500,000 of income tax during their working lives. They don't go around saying, I've got a terrible income tax debt of 500000 because... They understand you pay it if you're earning a certain amount. You don't pay it. Otherwise, it's not like a mortgage or a credit card. And the well, graduate just, debt is more like the income tax debt than like owing Barclays 50000 Except it's not like a credit card debt because the interest rate is much higher. But the interest, the interest rate is still, I think, is it 6% at the moment, something like that, which is significant. Yeah, and I think the... The interest rate has proved the most controversial feature. Of course, the government has pretty much abolished the interest rate. There's still an RPI link for the side of the debt. The government has pretty much abolished the interest rate charge because everybody's complaining about it. It's made the system slightly more regressive. But yeah, and look, I, I'm, I don't defend all the details of the system. And the next generation of politicians are perfectly entitled to change all these features. They can change the repayment threshold. They can change it. They are 9% if they want. They can have an interest rate, not have an interest rate. All that is where policy can change. But my prediction is that the system of basically saying graduates will pay back, which has been the British system now, no, sorry, the English system now, for 20 years under three different political parties, that system will carry on because there simply ain't the public expenditure directly to cover in grants. And because the graduates earn more, they by and large don't object, provided you don't try to get too much out of them each year. So I'm just going to ask uh, a more general question just to sort of wrap it uh, all up, if I can, because um, what do you think needs to happen right the way across the UK, not just necessarily in England, because we certainly with the universities, we have a slightly different um, funding model that will ensure young people are able to pursue the courses they want in the places they want. Well, we've got a a choice basis. I have to say, oh, look, sorry, I'm I re, I I've been trying to acknowledge all the problems, but one of the other features of the system we've now got because we got rid of number controls is that more young people get a fir their first choice than ever before. So when we used to try to control the number of people going to university, when it was all public expenditure, one of the ways we did it was allocated and we fixed a number. Someone in Whitehall sat down and said, you're the, uh, you're the University of Worcester, you're allowed 2,107 students, and you're the University of Durham, and you're allowed 3,291. And if you take one more, you'll be fined. Um, that was the old system. Now, I believe in choice, uh, freedom, 
and especially in a model where actually it's a graduate that will end up paying, not the taxpayer, my view is, um, and we did, we got rid of number control, so more people get their first choice. I think the, um, and what they mustn't be influenced uh, too much about is um, all the pressures to think, I need to do this, get, do this course that somehow puts me on a track to a high earning job. Because if you choose something that leads to a low earning job, you won't be obliged to pay back. And I don't like the idea of a young person knocking on the door, asking for more education and being turned away because the fixed number of places at university is full. Thank you very much. Um, apprenticeships. My father ran the apprenticeship program at a Birmingham engineering firm. And um, and he was incredibly proud of what he did, and he was right to be proud. Apprenticeships are part of the mix. However, Britain isn't Germany, and apprenticeships are a much bigger part of the German model because they have many more licenses to practice. They have many more jobs where they say, you can only do this job if you've got an apprenticeship. It isn't that a way of excluding people from those jobs, though? Well, it can be. And I'm uncomfortable with it, but it is no accident that apprenticeships thrive in highly regulated labor markets where they are a condition for more and more jobs. Mm. Now, I'm even up, and I instinctively want, as you can say, I believe in freedom and choice. I would be up for, I don't mind some experiments, I don't mind people identifying some defined new roles and saying, we hereby require that you have an apprenticeship as the only route into that job. I think it would be quite interesting to go through the controversy, even for um, you know, in some electrical trades or whatever, and just see what happened. I don't mind, but I think you will. It is it is quite a deep seated feature of the economic structure of Britain, America, Australia over thirty or forty years that we by and large not gone down that route. So look, I, I love apprenticeships. I think it should also be available to people, but there is a supply constraint. It has to be an employer that wants to take on an 18 year old. They don't all wish to do so. And ideally they seem to depend on a legal requirement. You can only work in this job if you've got an apprenticeship qualification, which is the German way of doing it. And Britain hasn't had that for a long time. I mean, you, you started by saying that you wanted young people to be well informed. Yes. And I think we, we would all um, agree with that. Um, they're not really that well informed about the choices they're making, many of them. Um, and I mean, there's some information out there, as you know, about, you know, your increase in earnings if you go to university. But in terms of HE, the, you can't compare institutions, how well they're doing. How, you know, whether one in the north is doing better or worse than one in the south. And that's because there's just not enough data. There's what, Why do you think that yeah. there isn't enough data about HE institutions? All apprenticeships. I mean, it's, it's, it's everything. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I think all of this, we need more information. And we've made a start with, and again, I actually was the, guy, was the minister who fought the battle to get this earnings data that you analyze in your excellent research report available for you guys to analyze. So that's, so that's good. Um, the, the, but because it's based on tax returns and tax returns don't have um, hours worked, it's very hard to capture um, the part-time effect. Because earnings are lower in some parts of the country than others, and where and the employment coding can be the headquarters of the company, it's, it's quite hard to disentangle when you... It looks as if some universities outside the Southeast do less well, but is that just telling us that earnings there are less good, are lower? And of course, sometimes living costs are lower. Um, it looks as if women do better. We've had if someone outside would say we hadn't talked enough about the gender issue. It does look as if women do better from higher education than men, which may be because there are some classic non-HE function course, uh, 
options which tend to be stereotypically male, though that is changing, you know, some um, from long distance lorry driver to plumber, rightly or wrongly. Um, uh, there aren't the equivalent for women. So it looks as if women in particular gain from going to university. Um, but the more, but I want a big, diverse, rich debate where we don't just think there's one model of being a good university and there are other universities of bad universities and we don't and we understand that FE colleges do a heroic job with 16 to 18 year olds they do a heroic job with adult learners they do a heroic job in helping to deliver apprenticeships and they also actually play an important role increasingly in deliver higher education courses in partnerships with universities so we don't need to make it an HG versus FE argument I mean, it is actually very interesting, and our State of the Nation report last year bore this out, that ethnic minorities and women are outperforming, uh, you know, basically white working class at all levels of education now. So not just universities, not just uh, higher education, it's also at schools and, and beyond. And and I think, look, and I saw this in my constituency because we had a big council estate and people used to bike or get on the train and go to work at Portsmouth Dockyard. And it, what, there was a time when life was relatively straightforward. At 16, you went to, you stopped, you left school and went to the dockyard. When the dominant employment route, and look, I was brought up in Birmingham and there were all those engineering firms. Um, when that dominant straightforward route into a predictable job disappears. There are some working class communities for whom life gets very tough. And there are lots of things we need to do to help them. But oddly enough, I do think more options for higher education is in the armory. It is one of the things that will help them. Well, Dave, that's been a fascinating, incredibly interesting from my point of view. Um, lots of Aunt Sally's I put up and you knocked them down instantly. Um, still passionate about the subject, which is fantastic. And, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for being part of um, Social Mobility Talks. And thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Rob. Very good to see you again. And thanks for your question. So thank you for joining us. Um, so where can you go to find out more? Well. Go, if you want to see any of our research, uh, particularly on the value of qualifications work, please visit our website. Uh, please join me for further episodes of Social Mobility Talks podcast, where we'll be discussing a huge range of social mobility topics. And make sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or YouTube so that you never miss an episode.